Ah, uh, yes. Greeting, greetings, my fellow geothermal students. Jonathan Bow here. Uh, ready for topic seven? Whoa, man, we're almost halfway through this course. Can, you know, some good stuff going on today. I want you to be getting excited about uh, some new discoveries as far as earth batteries and telluric energy is concerned. So uh, that's all based in the geothermal, the heat, you know, in the mantle and the, the geomagnetisms that are created. So it's they're starting to unravel some of uh, what Tesla came up with way back when. But, um, exciting stuff to talk about today. We're going to talk about the earth coupling, uh, slinky, slinky loops, and uh, and some of the assignments we've got several assignments for you this this time around. No quiz this week, but uh, a paper. Paper's coming due, so sit tight and tune in, man. Let's check this out. So here we go. Topic seven, week seven term paper. What I like about geothermal energy, and uh, it's not like what I like about my summer vacation. Let's make it a little smaller. How's that sound? I can do that. <clears throat> there. Uh, so now's the time to start thinking about an area of geothermal energy that you're interested in. Any facet of the science is available for your five-page, 1,200-word paper. Due week 12, 100 points possible. Please use current resources as the field of geothermal energy is growing and, rapid and changing rapidly. Include citations, resources, pictures, and graphs as you desire. You get extra credit if you can come up with an aspect of geothermal energy that I have not included in your course. NRG246, cool, Jabo. So, uh, I mentioned telluric energy just <laughs> because I kind of wanted to, that is some cutting edge stuff. We're going to look at that later in the course. But um, if I was going to do a paper, it would probably be on telluric energy and associated with earth batteries, heat generated by the uh, mantle of the earth, geothermal heat and uh, the magnetosphere that which is generated as a result of that. So, but now we can just go out and put an anode diode in the soil and, and uh, harvest energy, electrical energy. So with that median temperature lab, hopefully you're set up for that now. And that remember to record your temperatures from six feet below ground surface twice daily for at least 14 days, preferably eight hours apart. Include high-low ambient air temperatures and dates of the days you choose to record. We'll be averaging our results in week nine. Just want to remind you also that you know that your the siting, you know the slope of the site, the aspect of the site. You know, is it north, south, east, and west? Which way does it does it slope? You know, and vegetation. And if you really want to go get a A plus. Uh, do a little soil analysis too. Look at the horizons in the soil. Measure the the organic horizons. You know the A1, A2. The you know the and then when you get into the heavier clays or rocks, what do you got? You know what kind of dirt you got? It's important as far as conductivity and uh, how deep you have to go. How how deep cold will transfer. Likewise, how much insulation you have. I imagine that if you thought about that the more compacted the soils are, the more conductive they are, and the deeper frost can get. So more moisture it retains also. So drainage is a big part of your insulative dead air space. And then get into the smart geothermal chapters five and six. And these are all in your central column of your course here. Please read through chapters five and six in your text, the Smart Guide to Geothermal. And that's we're going to start talking about, or be talking about, the uh, earth loop headers today. The earth loop slinky, earth cooling, temperature installed ground loops, heat exchanger. And uh, once again, let's see, I'm just looking at your center central column in your course here. So, but we got to have a, a little bit of entertainment before we get too involved here. 
Because this is uh, so edumatainment, edumatainment, or intereducation. Here we go. This is like a love. Remember the Pacific Ring of Fire. Quick overview. Take a look at Antake. 53 local time. This is the location of the volcano in central Japan. You can actually see the crater on Google Earth. This is what uh, erupted just a few hours ago. stranded on the mountain. Uh, take a look at this. You can see the ash cloud wow. uh, just you know, erupting. Would not like to be the there. Atmosphere. Very, very scary situation to obviously be on the ground to uh, impact or feel the impact. It's catching them, man. Here it comes. Being, uh, created from, from this particular volcano as well. The local police a lot of them died. The Nagano Fire Department has re received several reports of injuries. And the Japan Meteorological Agency is uh, forecasting further eruptions as well. Take a look at the footage now, uh, Zane and John, because the ash cloud actually reaches the climbers. Listen. This is really compelling video, if you ask me. This is uh, really just fresh off of, off of YouTube. And, uh, of course, with Japan actually raising the, uh, the volcanic alert level to level 3, that means... Uh, obviously, the hikers not to approach the crater. You can hear the volcanic ash reaching, uh, reaching them on the mountain there. So quite, quite incredible footage to say the least. shortly before noon on Saturday. It's located on the border between Nagano and Gifu prefectures in central Japan. The agency upgraded its five-stage volcanic alert level to three, which urges people not to approach the mountain. 
Police say four people were buried under volcanic ash at the summit and elsewhere on the mountain. One of them was later rescued but is reportedly unconscious. And uh, this particular situation, as you recall, we've uh, been discussing the Icelandic volcano recently, uh, Bartabunga. And there's a difference between these two volcanoes. One uh, being that this crater was actually the volcano that uh, uh, was the was the part of the volcano that actually erupted, where the Bartabunga volcano was actually a fissure, which was actually out the side of the volcano. So that was not as intense, uh, but an eruption from the main chamber of a volcano like Mount Kentaka in central Japan uh, that can really send this ash cloud very high into the atmosphere. Again, the difference between that and a fissure eruption off of the side of the mountain means that the eruption is going to be a little bit less disruptive in terms of ash cloud going into uh, the atmosphere. So. Really amazing uh, video coming out of Japan. Uh, we just uh, really, uh, our hearts are off to those hikers. We hope that they yeah. can see. If we go back to, to, the, to the video, which we just uh, saw moments ago, so Jack, I mean, there are some conflicting reports. There could be 150 hikers here. There could be a, a, as many as 250 hikers. That's right. And uh, there, there are reports of injuries on the mountain as well from the Nagano Fire Department. Wow. And uh, with that many people still on the mountain, you know, uh, there's going to be a major rescue effort coming uh, the next hour. So. And well, what are the chances of further eruptions? Uh, out. With, the, with the Japan Meteorological um, Organization actually raising the level to level three, the alert level, that means that uh, eruptions are likely here in the next uh, coming hour. Police have sent about 80 officers to help with the rescue efforts. They're searching for people who may have been injured. Officials in Nagano Prefecture... You see, that's not snow, that's ash. Volcanic ash. It came down hot. To say the self-defense forces have sent a helicopter to the site after it made a request for help. The land ministry says at least 50 centimeters of ash has fallen near the top of the mountain. 50 centimeters of ash. You can't breathe. You move around, it flies up in the air. Gets, I mean, you just can't. It's a very bad situation. <laughs> Mount Ontake straddles Nagano and Gifu prefectures. People taking shelter in mountain lodges looked out as ash engulfed the buildings. Rescue teams arrived at the summit before noon. They're looking for climbers left behind in the lodges. Check this guy out. Geoff McClay. serious here. Violent eruptions, shorter duration in convergent tectonic interfaces.
getting some stuff. Is this the best volcano I've actually seen? It's good as Ambrim. Ambrim is good, it's better than the other boys. I think they've decided that it's getting ready to... <laughs> She's gonna blow! She's gonna blow, Jeff! Anybody for a hot dog roast? Got any marshmallows? It's really a pretty dangerous environment. All these uh, different gases floating around, getting the wrong spot at the wrong time. Sulfur dioxide. Or just CO2. Do you? Uh... We had a couple of particularly large explosions. There are two craters going at once, so you've got to watch where they're coming from. Uh, we had quite a number of large projectiles actually go overhead and land behind us, so uh, you don't want to be hit by them. That's it. Wrap one of those gloves around your face and see how much, see how much fun that is. It's incredible. That's an unbelievable sight. I can feel the, the heat of the lava again. through this visor. We're three quarters of a mile away, and even in this visor, I can feel the heat on my face. Yeah, that whole mass is steaming. Yeah, that whole mass is So I'll let you draw your own conclusion here. Is the earth hot, hotter in the core, or is, is geothermal energy a result of uh, insulation, sun shining on the surface, and it being stored in the ground? I think that's a less than 2% in my estimation. Less than 2% of the, the geothermal energy comes from the sun. Although on the surface, now it's a different, different ball game. And we're gonna look at, uh, hopefully we'll have time in this course to look at some solar applications in space as well as concentrating solar applications. Even at this distance, that suit's necessary because of the intense heat. About as close as a guy wants to get, huh?
Okay, one more volcano video before we get to our ground slinkies. It's a glimpse into the center of the earth. It's like listening to the heartbeat of the planet. The physiological effects of being inside the volcano are significant in that you have every force down there trying to kill you. All right, so let's, let's use the drone to... I wanted to share the Marum Crater uh, that's located in the island nation of Vanuatu by bringing a team with me and documenting this place in a way that's never been seen. The drone that we used is called the Phantom 2 Vision Plus. We had also GoPros mounted onto these particular drones with gimbaled devices so that no matter how much they shook, the video remained stable. We were able to take a series of thousands of photographs around the top of the crater and then process those using a specialized software to render the first of its kind 3D model of the volcano from inside. We were fortunate in that we got the footage we were looking for and unfortunate in the fact that we lost our drones. They uh, fell to their demise, some into the lava and others just from the incredible amount of heat uh, and unstable air. You have sulfur dioxide and toxic gases that are superheated and just an incredible radiant heat that exceeds a thousand degrees Fahrenheit standing right next to it. Well, if you're looking for extreme locations, it doesn't get much better than an erupting volcano on Vanuatu. We were there to investigate how quickly microbial colonization happens on rocks. We certainly wouldn't imagine that there is life in the lava lake itself, just way too hot for anything to happen. But the instant the rock cools to below about 120 degrees Celsius, it's considered a habitable environment. Getting a handle on how microbes can colonize this particular substrate is a good example of what will happen across the planet and has happened across the planet throughout geologic time. Having the cameras everywhere, particularly during the sampling at the very edge of the lava lake, is critical because we can go back and see exactly how far we were from the edge, exactly how closely distributed these newly formed rocks were. This isn't something you can measure in the moment. 3D reconstruction of the crater itself will be very useful and figuring out which layers are iron rich, which layers are sulfur rich. Within the caldera as a whole, there's certainly life. Coding. So, mineralogy and the botanical aspect or the uh, how quickly these Areas are recolonized by bacteria and viruses. It's amazing. Uh, there was also some research done in the hot pools down in uh, Yellowstone. And some of the viruses that they found had a convoluted crocacea, which is the egg shell, so to speak, the shell of the virus. And uh, they were so convoluted, and that was, there was so much space available on the skin of the, these. Uh, Microorgan microorganisms that they uh, got the idea for bubble memory uh, from for computers and stuff from that discovery as much as well as many other medicines you know how do these things survive in these extreme temperatures the walls as you go down okay another aspect of geothermal energy huh so medical at medical applications as well as mining and mineral applications on some of the surfaces down at the bottom, almost certainly there's a high microbial constituency. The greatest scientific value is just having videographic support that can be used in tandem with other research that's happening in the world. I really believe there's an opportunity to merge those worlds of exploration and tech and then coming back and reporting on all kinds of information that has not yet been discovered. Don't worry, we're not going to watch the bug-eating plants, okay?